Okay, so I am recording this for Warren and Ivy, and they are required to listen to it and to respond to it. And, oh, there's Warren. Okay. And um, anyway, so we're going to record this. This is the last day about the week has been about relativism and then about a response to relativism that says slavery is absolutely unnatural. And no matter how much you try to condition people into it, it will never be anything but horrible and wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, so what was Alicia, what was your, what comments did you want to make? Okay, well, I mean, the takeaway as far as moral relativism is that if moral relativism was accurate, nobody would ever stand up against slavery. You know, not, not even the slaves themselves, do you think? Right. I mean, if it's okay, it's okay, period. Right. Okay. Um, the rest of my responses were really just about the, the stories of the people uh, of Douglas and Sojourner themselves. Um, oh, you're not being great. I get that. Cody, I've already talked to Caleb about this and I'm in the middle of the class. Can we talk about it later? Please. Um, well, I'm tell you because if he doesn't want it, dad won't. I want it back. All right, go. Okay. No, just I'm not talking about it right now. I can't. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm scrolling through my notes. Well, um, wow, it, I mean, everybody's here. I'm yeah. happy. So, I, what I wanted to know from Alicia, and this is why I like teaching at Lion. I get to know the students, and I think I wonder what Alicia will think of Sojourner. <laughs> Because Sojourners, what drove her was this idea of God that her mother planted in her head. And what drove Frederick Douglass was, was this idea that you don't teach slaves to read or they become uppity. And each right. those were driving forces in each of those two. And those are the two main driving forces in life, right? Your yeah. reason or your faith. And that so was the one main, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I thought you were done, but what drove Frederick Douglass, that was one of the main points I had made, which when Mr. Hughes saw that he was learning to read, I expected him to say, you know, you're going to ruin the slave, we won't be able to control him, you know, but what, uh, what we wouldn't as readily imagine is how they kept the slaves oppressed and justified their actions by saying, it does no good for the slave. It makes life harder for the slave because then they'll be discontent and unhappy. And while, you know, while that was a truth of that reality, him having heard that was just as effective as learning the alphabet to spur him on to his, you know, to add to his will to fight. Yeah, and and I think the other thing that wouldn't occur to me is the seven year old overheard that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are people too, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and that at age seven, a seed gets planted, mm -hmm. but just like with Sojourner at age five, right? Yeah, with Sojourner, I actually, I would have liked to have met her in person. She seems very like her passion for God makes her a very strong person not willing to take somebody else's answers and make them her own she had to have her own answers no oh, i think um, i think your soulmates she's an yeah. artemis type she's mm -hmm. absolutely assertive physical you know and and the way she learned to think for herself about yeah. the bible i think that's great like it she made some mistakes right she was a sucker yeah, that's going to happen, though. Money. But by the end of the book, she's just talking back, and she's just having all her own opinions. When she was talking about the second advent? Yes. 
okay, it was bringing to mind the, um, like the evangelical movement. Yes. And she, like, she just stood back and looked at them like, these people are crazy. <laughs> but she didn't just let them be, you know, she gathered to them around her and they're like, she was like, look, what y'all, what y'all doing? Yeah, this is, this is what the Bible says. Just calm down. It's going to be okay. Go and pray. And to stand up to the preachers like that, that takes nerve. Not ever having had, you know, any official training or anything, having the courage of her convictions. That's, I just, that, that always impresses me. So think about how, how long ago that was. Yeah. And those are still issues right mm -hmm. you probably fantasize about that now oh, i wish i could yeah <laughs> and go and tell those evangelicals what i think i'm too much of a weenie i don't oh, yeah. know like i don't know that i would have done that <laughs> well she just no holes barred right yeah uh i'm glad that's why i want you to read the original text and not the outlines right yeah. not just yeah. the outlines you really have to have both because you got to get the feeling. You got to get it in your imagination. And you have to be able to imagine being her, right? Being these people. Like, and then we can have this here's the pattern stuff, right? But you have to have the story. And then you have your life story. Then you see the patterns. And then you're part of a whole lot of patterns too. So that's the way it works. Um, Warren. Yes, Dr. Beck. Okay. Um, I don't really have much of a comment to make because I, I made most of my comment last um, last guest, but I'll just go over them to see if any new ideas pop up as I go along. Um, as Alicia was speaking about moral relativism, as she was saying, it was right. My take on that was in the time when they, remember last class I spoke about how they had the idea of an ideal slave um one who doesn't know how to reason or really think much but do the work i think the reason why they really did that was because they knew that the slaves are actual people and if they had certain level of knowledge they would have started started a rebellion from doing the work much earlier because if they don't have the slaves to do the work who else is going to do the work and they definitely don't want to do it themselves because they realize how hard it actually is. And to say, oh, it got to a point where I brought up learned helplessness was the point where the slaves did not question the injustice itself totally. They realize, okay, this is how it's going to be. Let's question how or the type of injustice there is, not the injustice itself overall to me i think they were very i want to say i don't want to say evil there's much there's a more complex word i would want to use um to say evil but they did that out of pure selfishness and i don't know i would like to know what gave them the right or why did they think they have the right to do such things to say okay we are superior that's 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 my question even before this class, I've always wanted to know like what or who just gave him the power to say, okay, we are of lighter color and these people are darker, we're superior. That's that's my major question. I would I would like answered there. Because to me, I don't see much difference. We have it's not like they have three legs and we have two, or they have three arms and we have two. We have the same of everything. So I would like to know why I look down on these people force them to work for you and not pay them and then you go further to be like okay we don't want them to have any knowledge at all to question what we're doing to them so that's really the, the major question for me there well yeah so you know they must have known when the little black kids were kids that they were just like little white kids right? I mean, kids are kids. And they must have caught on that those kids weren't stupid, right? 
Yeah, as you bring up a point on K, I remember I was reading and it was saying um they they didn't really really made it a duty for the white kids, but the white kids kind of saw or they were taught to think that they are better than the other kids. And I'm like, I mean, if you're starting it from that young and ingraining in that that into them when they grow older, it's only gonna get worse and worse and worse. I thought you were about to say something different, but you reminded me of a part of the reading where he was having the poor white boys on Pilpot Street help him learn to read and how they actually kind of built up a type of friendship. And the little white boys were, they didn't think that it was right. They encouraged him. They're like, well, you know, maybe something will happen that will allow you to become free. Well, he just gave them bread. They didn't have enough food. Well, that's true. And it was a trade-off. I don't think they thought about it. <laughs> Kids don't think about stuff like that. And yeah, I don't. I don't think they thought about it that much. They were I, just. They didn't tell their parents they were doing it for sure. No, they didn't. But whenever uh, Frederick would, he said that he would talk to them about it. And, so maybe uh, they did know then. Because if they didn't, because if I'm a five year old, or not, not to say they were five, but if I'm a kid and I help my friend to do something, the first thing I'm going to do is want to tell my mom, hey, mom, I helped so and so to do this and whatever, whatever. So the fact that they were hiding it from their parents, I think maybe they knew. Yeah, and if he you would, and you get it. Yeah. He wouldn't mention their names either. I'm trying to look for it. Go ahead. He also gave them food. I think that'll yeah. do it, right? <laughs> yes. And also with the food as being the incentive, I think they would be inclined to tell their parents now to say, hey, mom, I got this from so-and-so because I was helping him to do this. So maybe they knew that something was going on and they hid it from their parents. So I, I, that would be my suspicion. Yeah, that's that's just what I'm anyway. Ivy, can you talk? I don't know. Ivy has connection problems again, so I don't know. Anyway, um, let's see. Let's go back to the outline, and I'll um, we can start. So. Uh, Let's see, let's start with Douglas. But I hope you understand that the original texts get you, they get your imagination engaged, right? And they get you emotionally engaged. They get, they give you a picture of the world that you just can't get if you just do analytic thinking. And I just, I've always been struck by teaching for 25 years that. I just think a lot of white people in the South don't have this in their head of how horrible slavery was, right? They just, they were told that this, the Civil Wars isn't about slavery. It's about something else like taxes. And it's just like, if they had a picture of how awful it was, they wouldn't want to say stuff like that, right? It just doesn't get brought up enough. You have to remember how horrible this was because we still live with this legacy, right? We still live with the collapse of the family. We still live with so much violence and we just have to own it, right? It has to be part of our historical imagination of who we are as a country right? We did that stuff. <laughs> and then the, the Blacks tried to come up north. And again, they suffered. I mean, they suffered and suffered. There's a, a book out, A Thousand Sons or something, and S-U-N-S. -S, and it talks about how the, the Blacks went to all parts of the country. Everywhere they went, they were discriminated against. And it's just, I didn't know that until recently, but we really need this story in our head. And now we're gonna have a whole election will be won by people trying to deny that or trying not to let kids learn about that in a way that would change their 
imagination, the picture of America and then the history of America. So we're, we're still trying to wipe it out or deny it or say, let's move on. We can't move on. It's, you, you have to deal with it. Um, you have to face it, I think, but anyway. So, oh, Warren, I was gonna ask you, in, in Jamaica, like the students I teach in Asia, the women, they know education is the ticket out of a much lower quality of life. So in Jamaica, do they, is, is there a high value of higher education because it's the ticket? Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, there is. Okay. See, that's another thing about the white supremacist movement is that all these other non-whites know that they have to work their buns off. They know education is the ticket. Well, they're going to end up qualifying for these jobs better than the whites, right? And so it's possible that some of them had an advantage for a couple, you know, 10, 15 years, although I think that's completely overrated. But even if it were true, they get it now, they raise their kids that way, where white people are still in this, too many are still in this grievance mode. It's just like, you gotta get off your butt, go to college, move, you know, be ambitious, because these other people know that life isn't handed to you, you know? So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think there's gonna be big shifts. I don't think we've seen the worst of it. Um, anyway, so slavery is completely unnatural, right? So you cannot mold people to be what they are not. No matter how severe the conditioning, the, the truth, whites don't deserve this power over non-whites is, is recognized by both masters and slaves, right? Especially if some of those slaves are half white, right? They're the master's kids, right? <laughs> Frederick Douglass, I think was uh, his master's, right? Kid. And so then the idea that the master's white kid can beat the master's black kid, right? And I think he had uh, his mistress wanted uh, her white kid to beat him more because he was lighter skinned. I'm sure that happened all the time, right? Oh, it's just so unnatural. It just, you if you really picture this, of course it happened. It happened all the time. It was standard practice. And it is so unnatural, right? He was separated. Children are separated from their mothers after birth and they're sold as property. Come on, you guys, this is like no way. And we must have this in our minds if we're gonna cope with our history. Um, talk about blunt and it destroys that natural bond. He saw his, hardly ever saw his mother. His father was a white guy, but she never said whether it was the master, right? She didn't tell him. Um, infidelity. So the, the owners have complete freedom to exploit their female slave sexuality. The black people have no chance to have any kind of a family, right? And you can't, like, you can't take that away from people. It's biological. It's just so perverted and evil. Um, let's see. Then there was the Sophia Auld when she started teaching Frederick to read and her husband said, no way. And then she changed. She had to try and show her husband and all the neighbors that she could be just as cruel as anybody else, which again, is just horrible. It's okay. Children see these acts of brutality against their family members. I mean, you can't, you, you're never gonna be able to socialize people to accept that. 
uh, white children recognize this. This is socially constructed. They, they sense it, right? They have an intuition that this isn't right, but then they, you know, uh, just overcompensate for that by picking up on it, right? It's just a corruption of character. It creates the seven deadly sins. This would be why some more Marxist interpreter would say it's economics that causes those seven deadly sins, right? Uh, it's not natural, right? And I mean, the counter to that is it's not healthy, but people do go to extremes. Uh, people need to learn how to hit the mean. But anyway, obviously it feeds into lust, greed, because you don't deserve that much wealth, pride, this unearned power, unearned status, Envy, wrath, anger, obviously it was used as a tool to oppress. Sloth, the rich don't have to work. And the slaves, whenever they're, when it, on the holidays, that was another really off story of the way they get socialized into it. Now we'll get to that. Gluttony, uh, uh, education uh, is, can be a corrupting influence, uh, but it is the ticket out, right? It's the corrupting influence is that it isn't distributed justly. Um, when he learned to read, that was the source of his hope. Um, Wollstonecraft talks about early associations and how powerful they are, but I mean, any psychologist can tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, an educated slave will rebel, and then that book that he found where people are having a conversation about ending slavery, that's that inner dialogue of the soul with itself. The Greek view of reason is that it's a dialogue inside of you. And he said, this dialogue was inside of me, which I think is so amazing. Um, then he started this school where he tried to help, you know, other slaves learn to read on Sunday. The holidays thing was awful because the slave owners would give them all the alcohol they wanted. And so they'd party and then they'd get violent. And then they would say, you see, we're by nature inferior. We deserve this kind of treatment. Oh, oh that's awful. Did you guys think that was awful? I'm sorry, hold, hold on. I got interrupted. Give me just a second. Okay. Um, Come over here and get my charger. So Warren, did you notice that thing about slavery? What part of it? Well, well did I have you read the part where on, on holidays, the masters would give them all the alcohol they wanted? Maybe I to convince slaves that liberty is worse than slavery. The right. slaves are masters or else they will not, they will be chaotic, uncivilized. Oh, you need to charge your I don't think right. I read that part. <laughs> Okay, oh. maybe I didn't assign it, so I'll just tell it. You know, you can picture it. They get drunk, they start fighting, and then everybody is convinced that yeah, we are by nature inferior. We need oh whoa, oh. it you you gave us only part of that. It was the fight with Master Covey. No, actually, it wasn't that one either. So oh, okay. Okay. it's possible that it was just a little section, and I didn't, you know. But anyway, does everyone have that pictured that that's what you do to oppress people? Yeah. It's so disgusting. Um, there, oh yeah, and this was where Warren especially was saying, people don't start out questioning the institution, but they question whose master is nicer, right? They question the way people perform in these roles. They don't question the roles. And so it was, if that was another thing that I'm sure was completely normalized was what kind of a master are you, right? And if this, if everybody knows the master that really can't get respect, he's just kind of a weenie. And so they have to, even against their own inclinations, the masters have to act horribly, right? 
And Covey had this reputation for breaking the human spirit. And so if you had a high spirited slave, you send them to Mr. Covey. Ah, it just, it's so awful. And yet, you know, that's exactly what happened everywhere. This is not just an exception to the rule. Um, Hopkins kept the broken spirit broken. Freeland treated the slaves well. And those were the ones that wanted to escape, right? <laughs> Give them an inch, squeaky wheel gets the grease. I mean, there's lots of that. Um, Sophie Auld was ruined by having slaves. Her disposition was totally changed. People don't realize the effects of legalized tyranny. Um, uh, economics, let's see, religion made them worse. And he talks about that. Um, and we still have this, you guys. We still have the churches legitimizing. It's a lot more subtle, but that, that's gonna, there's no problem in terms of the conservative churches are ignoring the issue of race. They don't want to hear about it. They, it's, religion is still used as a bludgeon. Um, okay, there was also Douglas, you know, reason his education drove him, but he still had certain times in his life when he felt like divine providence intervened. And that's important too, because you cannot believe that there's a God who's punching your, you know, but you can also just be super grateful. You can just know that that was unearned. Maybe there's a God somewhere, maybe there's not, but I will never forget this and I will always appreciate it, no matter what, because it really sent my life in another direction. Okay, then the politics of it. So people get to the point where they decide they're gonna be political actors and uh, the publicity, right? When it gets to political stuff, it's hard to tell because people compromise and it's hard to tell what the motives are. Some people just get to that point. They say, I've got to dedicate my life to making our society less racist. But publicly, many times they'll have the same public image as somebody who basically, I will do anything to get reelected. And if it means ignoring racism, that's what I'm going to do. And so you have to watch out for that because of political rhetoric, political uh, appearances, the way that politicians uh, try to appear to be something. So you have to do the research about who is this person? What's their motive? What were their experiences growing up? Why did they go into this? Stuff like that. But anyway, the arguments in favor of slavery are bogus. So this goes back to, um, this, I use the same outline as Mill, John Stuart Mill's subjection of women. The arguments are bogus. They're based on emotion, they're based on habit. Naturally inferior um, is really culturally constructed. The will of God is a misapplication. It's a corruption of the Bible. Again, it's still, it, the Bible or religion is still being used to support the status quo. Um, okay, we don't have any knowledge of the human psyche, and there were all this. Can I interrupt just a second? Sure. I think, in part, that may be the answer to Warren's question, because our culture is heavily informed by the Judeo-Christian tradition, and in the Bible, they did keep slaves. I know. Um, to pay off a debt that the person couldn't pay off and they would work until it was paid off um, or they were captured in battle and brought home but the actual biblical example of slavery that slave that's captured in, in, in battle is supposed to come home and become part of your family they're supposed to be treated more like Sophia Auld was going to treat Douglas in the beginning but they take the fact that slavery existed in biblical times to justify slavery by any means. 
Well, they that was the Civil War, right? They seceded right. from the Union. They and knew it was wrong, but if they could put a religious justification to it, then it then it was right. Well, we still and it still happens, yeah. right? Um, okay, that's what we again. It's so important that we understand the history because we keep repeating the the worst parts of it unless we just acknowledge. Um, why should someone speak out? Because equality has been tried and it's better. We know none of those pseudoscientific explanations, none of that stuff was true. Reason leads the conclusion, we've got to get rid of this. Slavery destroys both the master and the slave. Slaves accept their condition, right? Many of them do not. They begin by questioning the degree of oppression, right? the kind of master you have. Slaves are afraid to complain. Social conditioning is focused on getting them to accept it. Don't learn to read. History teaches people have false beliefs. The messengers are often hated or killed. People don't want the truth. Eventually the truth wins out. Um, modern people do not believe anyone is a slave by nature. It's freedom and equality. Um, free and open discussion is the way to go, is just flush it out, talk about it, hold someone's feet to the fire in terms of what, whether what they think makes sense. It makes no sense. Um, and you just have to keep, keep the conversation going so that you develop a better view of reality. Um, Psychological research, we have a lot of that now. Um, and the current practices are, if, if slaves really were uh, inferior, then Sophia oh, could try to teach little Frederick how to read and he would not learn, right? Uh, yeah, so her husband knew that this, this ain't fair. Um, so here's the Sojourner Truth. And um, that's the voice, you know, you start hearing her voice in your, in your mind, her reasonings. As soon as she saw God as an all powerful, all pervading spirit, right? And that was from when she was little. And she oversaw the publishing of this book. And so did Frederick. So these books really are those people's uh, autobiography the way they wanted to be remembered. So that's important. You know, it's not somebody else's take on their life. It's their take on their life. Um, so here, I also think a really interesting aspect of the book is that the first part is just facts about her life, right? She was born, her mother taught her to believe she was sold to him, she was in a tavern. She doesn't even talk about the tavern. I'm sure it was horrible. Then she had this master that she liked and she kept wanting to have babies, right? Just for him so he'd get more property. And that was, you know, she says, I can't believe I thought like that. But that was a case where people don't question the institution and she had a good master. Then she, you know, Thomas liked her and that was terrible. Um, she was promised freedom, it was broken. The Van Wagoner, the Wagoners were Quakers, part of the abolition, the underground. Then she had a son, this is a big problem. Again, the family falls apart. Um, she was called to be a preacher. She had this epiphany. Um, she really had trouble with her son. Uh, yeah, you know, what do you expect? Um, she joined this sect. She gave them her life savings. She, she was a sucker, right? So her belief in God drove her, but then she ended up getting manipulated. And then she caught on and she joined the Women's Rights Convention, the abolition of slavery. She just became this huge activist. Um, but then the next part of it was her spiritual journey. So you have your physical, what's going on physically, and then what you have on spiritually. So 
you know, technically at age 18, you came to Lyon College and you spent your time there. Well, what was going on like in your soul, right? You spiritually. So her concept of God, she made deals with God. Then she became happy and she stopped praying. <laughs> I, my students usually could say, I get that, I get that. Um, and she had a mystical experience, which I've had quotes on that earlier. Uh, Buddha, Jesus, and Arjuna. This is a standard thing in your late 20s. Um, God is love. Her conceptions of God became less personal. She realized people disagree. Old Testament writers disagree. Jeremiah thought of God as not personal. God came with the Jews when they had the, they were dispersed. Whereas Noah, the story there is he thought if he ran away far enough, God was on Mount Sinai and the sonar wouldn't get to him. So they have different ideas of God, you know. Um, her, okay, so she had this sense of her own vileness and God's holiness, uh, but she at least stopped thinking of her vileness as any worse than any other human being, right? Um, she recognized whites hated her, but she didn't think that was legit, right? Uh, family life, she couldn't afford to have a home. Again, the family completely broke down. Um, Let's see, she went to church with her sister without knowing it. Again, the family breakdown, um, false prophets. She rejects anything um, associating with any sect. Then she really starts to think on her own about religion and about God. And she leaves New York and she renames herself. And now she's on her spiritual journey. Um, and she has her own interpretation of Genesis. And by the end of it, she's an independent person. So here are the patterns. I guess I have five minutes. Someone planted a seed. And again, you all, college students can think about that. Sometimes it isn't until your late 20s that you really, it starts to come together because your brain keeps growing. And there is kind of a synthesis in your brain that that occurs in your late 20s. Um, children tend to think of God as a person. They tend to make deals. Um, children have faith in the way of life they grew up with, right? And, and they learn by habit and custom. And then she had a religious experience, which is a lot of people have that. You could say that in your late 20s, some people have an experience of science is going to save the world. That's their thing that it all comes together. It's religious in the sense that it's the sense of meaning and purpose. I want to be a scientist because I see how much harm religion does. And I want to dedicate my life to getting facts to people right? Or I want to be a historian because I understand the effects of history. Or I want to be an artist because I understand the effects of art. Whatever it is, it's a lot of, I want to run a company because I want to treat people with dignity and so that they can have a job and survive and still have their humanity. There's just a lot of ways to have that experience. There's two major crises in life. A young adults are breaking away and figuring out what they care about. And then in midlife, you have a reassessment. Um, you know, you know, ideally you've got, you've done the marriage thing, you've raised your kids and you know how to do a job. And now you're seeking, well, what is what I really cared about? Not just when I had to meet other people's needs. So people are on a meaning quest. Even if the quest is to advocate for science, it's a meaning quest. It's not just data. Uh, when people don't have a sense of purpose, they go nuts. Um, so uh, her idea of good gets less personal, gets less tied to a specific tradition. Um, we become aware of socialization and whether we agree 
we become aware of whether our society is socializing people for good or evil or just not apathy. Uh, their awareness of hypocrisy, awareness of false prophets, um, the duties to your family and your duty to public, public sense of purpose conflict. Um, they realize the difference between fixating on all the words in a text and living a certain life. And then they constantly seek for purity of heart and clarity of thought, right? And so their social activism would be based on, you know, what can I do now, right? What's the best thing I can do now to make the world a better place? So each of you, Warren, why don't you tell me your reaction to Sojourner Truth? Because I know you have to go in just a couple minutes. I have what I, I messed up what you were trying to say about it. What? Can you hear me? Try again. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm saying I haven't been through that one entirely as yet. I'm still writing down what I want. So when I submit the thing for this week, I'll have all my thoughts in it. I'm sorry about that one. Did you was there anything I said that struck you? Mm, not not necessarily i would when, say when you were a kid did you personify god did you make deals with god or anything not really no okay. my my thoughts weren't <laughs> focused there when i was a kid okay i mean i remember when i was eight years old i told my little sister i didn't think god was a person which yeah. and i was you know my mother wrote that down so i i you know i have some vague idea that i was thinking about what my dad was preaching about i had a very pious teacher in third grade and i think it just kind of resonated okay there's kind of a buzz she's kind of like my dad you know it's just very vague um yes. but kids are different you know and um especially preachers kid <laughs> Mm -hmm. that's why i asked you know because you just figure out what your dad did isn't the same as what other people's dads do and yes. i the one thing i really struck my i had a, a friend say she doesn't know what her dad does at work is like that was incomprehensible to me absolutely incomprehensible because <laughs> i was really part of my dad's mission you know yes. oh my god so that's why I thought you might have an opinion, but maybe on Monday you can just start out by saying, hey, Dr. Beck, I did have an opinion on that. Yeah, Mon okay. Monday is spring break, Dr. Beck. Yeah, no, a week from Monday. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, Give, leave it to me to forget, but I didn't forget. <laughs> yes, Dr. Uh, Beck's classes don't go on spring break. <laughs> well, Mother's classes don't know. Right. <laughs> okay, Warren, have a good break. Bye. Thank okay. you, and same to you, Dr. Beck. Okay, Alicia, did you have an opinion about Sojourner? Well, I just thought that she really, the part of your outline in the arguments against slavery, you know, is that it was bogus. Her story really shows her, her character, her personality says that without her even having to speak the words, you know, she sees it and she just, and now she did, she did watch and learn about these people for a little bit. I, I remember it saying that, but then she wasn't willing to just say to herself, no, they're wrong she had to speak out she had to say something to them just like frederick Douglass, it was not enough for him to get his own freedom he had to speak to his sabbath school people and see if they wanted to come it's not enough if you have that drive to change things and just the way that she developed her own relationship with God through her thoughts about Genesis and she didn't stop there. She just kept 
she just kept going. She didn't listen to the world saying this is right or the culture or the society saying this is right. So that that was the biggest she stood thing. up to men too, you yeah. Know? And there was the women's movement and the abolition movement were kind of simultaneous, mm -hmm. which is, you know, natural. It happens a lot because once you start doubt, doubting, mm -hmm. right, you start doubting. Um, so let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. The other thing was the way that she could not keep her family together, right? She absolutely could not have a decent family for her son and then also live out her calling. And that yeah. stuff is still true, but she the way that families were crippled by slavery. Uh, I know. And I think I need to read the whole book to get that sense. But I did pick up on, you know, I could relate to her strengths, yes, but also to her weaknesses. Like when she went to Colorado, I think is where it was. Her friends that she left behind thought she had killed herself. And I can't remember that. But at least I think that's what it said, or they just knew that she was dead. But I thought that, you know, how many people have thought I'm just off my rocker and crazy and I'm off doing my own thing. But I don't guess I really know how to, I'll have to think about it more to be able to express it better, but I have, I have had that part in myself as well. There were several years where I couldn't, I could not make anything work. And there were times when I thought, all right, it is them or me. I have to leave, or I just have to get rid of them or something. I, it was, it was awful. And I don't know if that was the choice she made, like she chose to stop trying to keep her family together and then journeyed on. I think Peter went off on a boat because I think she thought, you know, he'll have men, mentors, you know, he'll have okay. order in his life, right? It's like sending a kid into the military. Mm -hmm. Well, then, when I left Matt, I would not leave. I, I, the reason I stayed so long is because of Cody and Lucas, who I had not legally adopted and was not willing to leave behind. When I left Matt, they had moved to Texas and they were trying to make things work with their biological mother. And that was what gave me the freedom of choice to leave. So, well, the collapse of the family is bad. Yeah. And it's bad if it's black or white, right? Or green, I and mean, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. Um, and so the thing is, blacks have had it harder in terms of trying to have some kind of a coherent family structure. Yeah. Plus, if they have a tribe, you know, the grandmother, they used to have tribes. I don't know how much of it still is more like a tribe. There's nothing wrong with that right it just doesn't enable you to move you know for your corporation to be able to tell you to move right so maybe you don't get the top-notch jobs but i know that my son had a had a african-american kid in his basketball team i mean he was on an inner city basketball team and it was great because it was like a mini city here's all the dynamics it had the upper class white kid whose dad was living vicariously through that kid and the kid was rebelling and not playing his best because psychologically he just didn't want to be the little daddy's boy yeah so it was the rich white kid had troubles then there was the black kid from the tribe and his grandma you know an extended family like they kept so so just not having a dad isn't necessarily the worst thing, but of course it's a problem. And then you have housing and education and all this other stuff. So of course it's a problem, but, but you know, white people have problems and that has to do with class. In 1980s, 
Ronald Reagan and the Republicans destroyed the unions. And that's when women went to work. But there weren't any accommodations made for decent daycare or after school care. It's just like you just go to work and uh -huh. add work and stir. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and it, and then I don't, you know, when people don't have hope, they don't have a plan. Anybody can get someone pregnant, you know? And so we don't have an ethos. We don't have, we just, it, if we could just understand our common humanity and the problem is we need to tax the rich and have decent services for people so they can function. That's, I mean, that's what I think, but it is, it is amazing to me about are you surprised that you could identify with Sojourner as much as you do? Yeah, but mostly because I didn't really know anything about her. And she is, all, all I knew, I didn't know that she was involved necessarily with women's rights, but she, I, I knew she was involved with, um, the abolition movement and I didn't expect to relate to that so yeah and my students I but I mean the whole the way I structure thing is we have a common humanity mm -hmm. right you wouldn't think on the surface that you'd have a lot in common with a woman slave who well, slavery right and another thing she had that I had in common with her, but she also had in common with Douglas is that, okay, in the very first section of the reading, it says she didn't lose her moral integrity and neither did Douglas. I mean, he was able to look at the situation and sympathize with the plight of his master father, you know, and his owner brother, you know, brother was whipping brother and father was whipping son and Douglas picked up on how hard that must have been for them. What kind of person does it take to have empathy for the oppressor? <laughs> you know, understanding that, that sense, that presence of mind to understand not just your own situation, I guess. Yeah. Well, and that Covey was trying to break his spirit. Yeah. Well, that was quite a story. Yeah, yeah. And he just, he said he lucked out, right? There was a couple times in his life where he just feels like, if that hadn't happened, like I would be one of those problem mm -hmm. slaves. I would die that way. And I have experiences like that in my life, right? It's just like, oh my God. And I'm just grateful, right? I don't like to say there's some God in the sky because what about all these other things, you know? I mean, what about the woman whose kid dies? I mean, I don't really want to go there, mm -hmm. but I do, I don't ever want to stop being grateful for those things that happened, right? It's just uh, luck. And so the way he expressed that I think was good because you can combine reason with this just recognition that these events happen, whether there's a God or not, maybe there is, but yeah. still we have to still function according to our reason and hold people accountable for what they do. And you can't quote the Bible and say anything. Um, we're just, we're just not learning. And I, again, I knew some, I know some Southerners kept, kept saying, yeah, you have to study history, but then they sentimentalize Southern history, right? I mean, they'll tell the story of Southern history by how nasty those those Yankees are, right? I well, mean, they, they look at the plantation slaves and say, oh, well, those are the exception. Whereas okay, in the in the Douglas story, the city slaves were well treated. Oh, that's the norm. Okay, the house slaves on the in in um, oh, what gone with the wind, gone with yeah. the wind. what oh, was it? Terra, the house slaves on Terra, they were 
I don't know, pictured as being that was well a, treated and having positions I mean, of honor yeah. and that whole that whole event. I read about the history, the context of that. Mm -hmm. And that book had a terrible impact on our country not moving forward, right? Yeah. And Margaret Mitchell. Um, gosh, there's a book of essays that I really should try to find used. Ah, it was called, oh my gosh, I can't remember. It had, and it had that essay about her and Anne Rand. I think I've already read that one. I think you put it on our reading material um, in Women's Issues. I'm pretty sure. Hold on. What, about Margaret Mitchell or about I, Anne Rand? I think maybe both of them. Hold on. And there was an essay about Nora Hurston. I, I mean, some money on I say my biases with the Centaur on the film. Anyway, there's there's every kind of woman, you know, just like every kind of man. They they all have stories. Um, but I I think too much of the academy, like you'll take a poetry class, but you won't talk about it in terms of patterns. Or you'll talk about it only in terms of the historical context, as if that's the defining characteristic. Um, or then you'll take a history class from the disembodied mind. Although I think the person we just hired sees it from the point of view of people living history. Um, I mean, I just don't like the way the academy splits up people's lives into these pieces and it never comes together. But I mean, that's the nice thing about teaching philosophy. I can define my discipline as putting it all together. Whereas most philosophers are the worst. They'll sit and analyze something to death in a way that is completely unrelated like there's nothing at stake here but you don't have to deal with that uh it's just unfortunate um so i bet you're ready for spring break huh <coughs> yeah maybe i've got some papers to work on so you think you but you think it's workable for the next week huh yeah yeah i think so um I mean, they're all, it's all stuff that I am familiar with. I have a, at least a little bit of a knowledge base. Um, well, with, I have a little bit of a knowledge base, but I haven't really read much of James's work. And that's on, that's what one of the papers is on is a book review of his variation or varieties of religious experience. So that one I may spend, have to spend a little bit more time on, but. Have you read the book? No, I have it. I've started it like five times and haven't gotten past, I don't know, the end of the first chapter. So we'll see how far I actually get. Well, I'll see. I I don't know how much of it I've read, but I, I enough so that I'd be curious to see what you think. Um, yeah, and then, um, so we have the honor induction on May 3rd. Did you get yeah. those messages? And then your paper for which class? Philosophical psychology just be kind of your synthesis of the RPH program? Is that, I think that's what I said. And so you could start writing outlines of that. Let's see, the senior exit interview will be the last week of classes. So it'll, and the paper won't be due till the end of final week. So if you want to just start accumulating notes and it's no biggie, that's only two pages. And just so you'd have something to present because yeah. I, I think- Well, am, am I going to do that this semester or am I going to do that next semester? Well, if you only have one course, right? 
I think you should do it this semester because these are the students you've had classes with. Yeah, yeah. And we don't do it in the middle. I mean, we could do it in December or November, but you'd be the only one. Yeah, yeah. It's up to you. I guess you have a choice, but um, it's fun. It'll be fun with some of those other students, I think. But you don't have you don't have to if you're coming back. No, that's fine. I'll do it. Um, yeah, because the, the exit if the exit interview isn't necessarily a big assignment. I was more worried about writing a final like that a paper like a final a senior paper. Okay, and this afternoon is when I'm going to do all the posts. Okay, that's my bad. I'm just. I'm not, I'm not driving myself crazy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Alicia, I know you are, but I, I've been there. Well, I mean, I'm trying not to, honestly. I'm, it doesn't do me any good. Like, I mean, if I get behind, I, I have to be more of the mind. Well, I'll just, you know, I'll just have to catch up. I can't just rush and kill myself to get it done and stress out about what the grade is going to be. And I mean, it just, it is what it is. So, and I mean, things go a lot smoother when I can think like that. So, okay, well, I'll see you next Tuesday night. Yep. I'll Unless, see you next. If you can email me and change your mind. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye.